Okay. Um, so we are starting now. Somebody told me that we are streaming already. So hi, people from wherever you are. It's kind of awkward. So welcome to the February event of uh, Art Science Salon, which is uh, also the second event of uh, Laser Toronto. Um, uh, which is part of the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous series in Canada. And uh, we are the first one together with Montreal. So uh, before we start, um, so the, uh, my name is Roberta Bujani, and I'm a co-curator uh, of uh, Art Science Salon. And uh, you can see in uh, the... Uh, background or in the second screen uh, for those people who are at home, uh, our website, artsciencealon.com. If you are an artist or a scientist or a person who is interested in doing interdisciplinary work, please check it out because I am actually collecting um, profiles from uh, now Ontario based, but then I'm, I'm expanding to Canada, um, artists and scientists who want to collaborate with each other and uh, uh, here are some of the profiles that I collected. So you can check them out and you can send me uh, your profile. Also, you can see the blog uh, that has all the events. And this is our event today. So our event is titled Fibers, Textures, and Textiles. Uh, but before I introduce uh, the topic, I would like uh, uh, Nina said lady to say something about laser. She is in the board of uh, Leonardo, and uh, she has... Like, without her, we would not have uh, uh, the, the international streaming. Thank you. So, so my name is Nina Sagredi, and I am, as Roberta said, on the board of Leonardo is ICAST. And I observed the growth, rapid growth, of laser events in the U.S. So I uh, tongue-in-cheek proposed that we should uh, maybe extend this to some remote country like Canada. And uh, lo and behold, they accepted it. And so this uh, was over the last year, and now we have... Uh, we started our Canadian network with Toronto and with Montreal, and uh, we will have about four events in each Toronto and Montreal every year, which are laser events. So we work closer together with Roberta and Arts and Science in Toronto, but uh, it is just a collaboration. You are more than welcome, and if anybody wants more information on laser, just look it up. It's on the web. <laughs> and laser is also acknowledged on our website, and there's a link to it too. Um, so um, uh, I also have to uh, say a couple of things. So I am, uh, I said, I'm the co-founder of this uh, uh, art size salon, uh, together with Stephen Morris, who won't be able to be here because he's having dinner. No, he's, he's having a, a, an official uh, conference presentation at McMaster, so he won't be able to be here. He would if, but maybe maybe he's at home, he's, he's uh, there uh, listening to us. Hi, Stephen. So, uh, um, what else? Okay, so let's start. So, uh, this event uh, uh, today is called Fibers, Textures, and Textiles. And I see uh, some people from the textile uh, community here. Uh, uh, but my intention was actually more interdisciplinary in uh, um, um, my like little strange thinking. Um, because uh, uh, when I think about uh, textiles, I'm also thinking about textures, and I'm also thinking about fibers, as in um, uh, the computer fibers. So, um, um, and, and so uh, this brought me to think about the jacquard loom, which was demonstrated for the first time in 1801, and that has actually initiated a whole series of development in computer science and computer development. So we owe uh, the textile industry for the developments in computer science. Or at least this is one of the hypotheses, and I like to 
think of it like that uh, because I I I loved um, the um, the punch cards uh, and uh, and I like um, the loom when it waves uh, it weaves uh, things together is just uh, something beautiful. So in uh, uh, thinking about this event, then uh, I thought, well, how can we bring up? all of these uh, um, different interdisciplinary aspects. And the solution is in uh, calling three different artists who are somehow connected with the idea of uh, textures, textiles, and fibers, but at the same time are not, or they are thinking in unconventional terms uh, of these uh, things. So uh, I want to um, uh, introduce... Uh, uh, I will introduce uh, uh, the artist. Uh, so the first uh, artist is um, Catherine Walter. Uh, she will be followed by Megan Price and then Rubai al um, So Catherine Walter is a felt artist and the founder of the Felt Studio, which is a very interesting um, uh, company and also a laboratory. So she does research and art and architecture and, uh, and uh, she works with industrial felt in there as well. Um, and uh, I, I really encourage you to go on our website and check her website. There's a link. Uh, her work is fabulous. Uh, so she, um, her training includes art history at Queen's University and studio art at Emily Kerr College uh, of Art, and she received her MFA from Concordia University. Uh, she has created a body of work ranging from uh, intimate artworks to larger scale commissions. Again, go look her, up her website for her incredible um, um, exhibitions. Um, her work has been um, exhibited in Canada, the U.S., including the ROM, the Design Exchange, and uh, Cooper Hewitt National Design uh, Museum in New York City. So, um, and, and she noted that in 1999-2000, uh, she um, uh, created an exhibition at the Texas Museum, and this prompted her to create this studio, uh, which is called the Felt Studio. So without further ado, uh, Catherine Walter. All right. Is that better? Do you do you feel comfortable speaking in the microphone? Sure. Supposition. <laughs> Thanks, Roberta. It's uh, um, nice to be here. It's really uh, interesting to have a, this kind of interdisciplinary context, and we'll have a lot of different um, directions here, I think, and be um, interesting to see what comes out of it. But um, I'm going to um, begin and sort of talk a bit about the material felt and um, my work. And uh, yeah, it's been about 15 years now since I started uh, um, working with uh, felt. And before that, I worked in a range of media, but always um, I've been interested in the intersection of, between visual art, um, material culture, and the built environment. And I've sort of found a way to converge all of these things with the felt studio, which um, I started um, actually... I, I started this um, idea of felt, actually, as a company, but also as a label and as a studio. And I consider it as a laboratory, as Roberta was saying, um, because I think I like the idea of the um, of a company being um, about exploration, not not always about you know product, business, or bottom line. So um, I'm going to show you some projects, but I did actually bring some felt um, that I thought I'd pass around. Roberta encouraged props, so I. <laughs> so this is industrial. Do you want to pass those? Let me just pass them. So these are industrial felt piece um, samples, and um, uh, they are um, a range. You can see there's a range of thicknesses and densities, and uh, um, you know I was actually wanted to uh, talk about the material itself because it is quite unique in the world of textiles. Um, I, actually, when I was thinking, uh, talking to Roberta um, uh, early on, I sort of thought, um, you know, in math and the Fields Institute, the context we're in, and uh, in some ways, in a very rudimentary sort of math way, it's, I think, um, 
felt somehow defies mathematics because it is um, lacking order, no pattern or formula. You can see this is a microscopic uh, um, detail of felt, and it is um, really just pressed fiber. So it isn't, um, in fact, I've heard it um, talked about as sort of an outcast from the field of textiles in the sense that it's not built on the warp and the weft, and it's... Um, uh, not a series of knots like knits, so it's not it's it's not like the womb. In fact, it's argued to be predate the to be sort of the first man-made textile because it does predate the loom and its making. And it's got it's quite rich in um, in its history. It's mythologies about how it was made, and um, this is basically wool. You can see the um, fiber on the right is a wool fiber, and it's made with barbs. And if there's textile people in here, you may this may be. Um, you may well know all of this, but I thought, I, you know, given the, the situation, a lot of interdisciplinarity that I sort of run through kind of how it's made. So it, the, the barbs on each fiber, um, under, when they're subject to heat and agitation, um, they open and then close upon which one another and, and create that felted mass. And yes, yeah, so it's sort of mythic in its um, kind of history. There's argues, arguments that, like, she was founded by shepherds who... Um, to uh, fleece from the sheep and put it in their sandals and after walking miles made felt. <laughs> so it's so that basic process. Um, so historically it's probably best um, oh, um, known in uh, parts of Asia, in Mongolia, um, maybe if people are familiar with the yurt, this is a Mongolian yurt. So these are felt houses are also made in Turkey and parts of Afghanistan. They're also called known as gear. Gears, G E R S. Um, felt rugs. This is one from Afghanistan and camel um, saddle blanket um, and shepherd's coats too. This is what's interesting about felt. It's like hats it can be also made in one form. So you have a um, uh, you can make the felt around a shape. So it's felted around a, like a hat. It's blocked, and in this case, it's actually a, in the round. So starting with um, sheep, the, the, the tones of gray that you get are all uh, very, they all vary. So each batch, that's the thing about the, the no pattern, no code, is that each batch is different. And, and tone-wise as well, it's all a mix of either white or black sheep and a mix of gray and brown. So the results are what you see, that kind of a range. And um, the, um, what to have, the, the, once the, the sheep are sheared and the um, fib fibers are collected and, and picked and blended and um, in this case, all by hand, and then and prepared for carding, and then laid out um, on in, in the desired form. In this case, on a sort of a reed um, screen. Sometimes it's like a mother felt that's laid out, so that it can then be rolled up and is literally beaten and and fold is actually the term that's used. And it's in this case in the um, this, this cultural practice really is um, it is kicked around and and in some cases then it's unrolled again in this case with a pat when you've got especially these patterns it's unrolled and then sometimes another a layer is added on it thickens it and it's literally a combination of sort of uh, increasing uh, fibers to gain thickness and density and, and the amount of it, that things are full that the, the felt is full it creates becomes more dense so here and then pick up the uh, the rigor on the <laughs> the fulling with um, the camel and in some cases then it's just taken up in the back of a horse or a camel and that more um, hefty uh, fulling process makes a denser felt. So I like to show this is because it's kind of fun. That the, the felt has become quite a cottage industry. You see a lot more. It's very popular. It's a big, huge craft um, development. Um, lots of felt out there you see handmade. And there's many ways to make it and it's kind of from the kitchen sink to, uh, you know, carting it behind your bicycle. But what I work with really is the industrial felt. And I'm going to show you a series of images that are, they're fun. They're actually quite fabulous photos from the 50s. Um, this, this old machinery, but it does give you a sense of the way it's made with large machines in tons of fiber. And uh, so this is the blending and the picking by a machine. And then preparing, it's the carding. She's feeding it into the carding machine. It's laid out in cards. They're bats, and they're laid out on top of each other. Again, depending on the thickness required and specified, it, more bats are laid. And this is the hardening. So the hard between the hardening and the fulling um, is really what is the felting. 
And uh, so this is a huge platen steel agitated um, piece of uh, huge piece of steel that just um, moves on top and creates the steam and uh, causes the fibers to felt. And this is a very old filling fulling machine, but it gives again you can see it's that roll it's rolled up and then um, and beat with hammers literally in this case, and then uh, it's pulled out and inspected sometimes and, and it goes back and again the fulling depending how dense the felt is to be it gets put in again and um, goes through various processes um, um, in and out depending on how long and uh, the final then the drying and tentering sort of pulls it back into that roll stock shape that is then rolled up to uh, um, inventory. Well, inspect and then inventory. And um, and uh, this is actually a little modern hardener, but you can see on the uh, on the far end that thickness of bats then co could come down to like even maybe a half inch or a quarter inch, even depends on, again, how much uh, um, pr hardening and how much fulling. And so industrial felt primarily is used for industrial parts. So you get the, you know, from, it's got great qualities. Wool gives it the great qualities for um, wicking oil. It's used a lot for seals and gaskets. Filters is a huge part of what um, felt's used for. In fact, filts is the German word for felt, and that is also the word for filter. And it's an interesting, it's a... Um, it's actually much more common in Europe, but um, I, so this, as Roberta said, I started this, my felt, the whole, um, my exploration of felt through this uh, project I curated for the Textile Museum, and it was uh, sort of a social history of felt, really, um, in Canada, and it was actually a two-part exhibition. I commissioned some artists to do works, but I'm going to just look at sort of uh, this particular um project because it was sort of interesting and it's a sort of a social history of felt from beaver hats to hockey pads and it sort of um, really looked at the scope and diversity of the material and um, and uh, sort of played up on some of the stereotypes of the um, culture too. Um, so during the fur trade you see on the left um, beavers were found in the new world um, and they were um, they drove an already well-established millinery trade in, in Europe and really took it to new levels. Um, as you can see, the hat, the traders on the uh, left are um, all wearing this cavalier style hat, and they're all beaver hats. They're made from beaver pelts, actually. And um, on the right, you can see T Terry Sawchuck, who's one of our famous NHL stars, <laughs> um, wearing felt hockey pad, or, ha or rather shoulder pads. He likely has some pat felt in those. Uh, goalie pads as well. But it was very common in the equipment from the 20s on through the 60s and 70s. Um, it's now been replaced. Unfortunately, a lot of um, felt in, that we're going to see um, has been replaced by newer materials. As you can see, it is a very heavy labor. A lot of it has literally gone south so um, or offshore. But um, it's interesting to see sort of how it's evolved. Um, hats, of course, um, the show I, I went on through... Um, the cowboy hat meets the uh, classic Mountie, both, uh, and actually rabbit fur, I think the um, Mountie hats are made from. Um, and boot footwear, of course, uh, cold winter uh, weather gear. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, felt, felt provides good wilderness tips in, as filters, uh, canteen covers, um, insulators. Um, even a maple syrup filter on the right. Um, pennants mark the landscape from coast to coast, the souvenir pennants. Um, Easter, um, maritime and Quebec craft, these are penny rugs that are so-called for their the circle shape and also their, their thriftiness. They're made from scraps. In fact, this one on the top, the pennants, I think, were cut out to make the fringe on that. Um, so felt grew really with um, alongside the steel industry in North America, and it's closely aligned with the development of the automobile. So you can see that the, it's the wool content that really gives it that range of material property. And it's quite vast, as I said, gaskets, seals, padding, cushions, liners. Felt um, And felt really uh, peaked during the war, because it was really used in um, a lot of armaments production. And um, so after the war, it uh, found its way into domestic markets, um, Including felt skirts, some remember. So, but so a lot of these are um, older images, and they do um, represent somewhat of a fading um, industry, certainly in North America. But um, 
it uh, has kind of risen in, in the design world, and I sort of rode a wave and picked up, um, started the Felt Studio 15 years ago, as I said, and started with a product line, making handbags and cards, I didn't need I also kind of like just the clean lines, a really a simple bag. And um, I'd had a lot of felt around through the, you know, been researching it and realized the scope through that, the research project. And um, so what I've done, uh, use, use in is basic simple rectangular shapes. I like the clean and minimalist aesthetic. But I also is intend to maximize the yield. So actually this is where math kind of comes into my work, is I actually really do use it a lot to say very much my designs are based on maximizing the yield of the material in order to reduce waste. Um, so this is a kind of material that I have around. You can see, I'll show this image because you can really see the sculptural quality of it and the influence um, it had on, on, other work, on, on my work. And uh, I made this chair, was commissioned by the Design Exchange um, in, uh, I think, 2002. And uh, it's using, again, the maximum yield. It's using the two-foot pieces are stitched. It's a six-foot wide roll. So these, the two-foot pieces are stitched together and made into this accordion. They're bolted across four rods, and then four posts are bolted to that, and then they're, it's wrapped around um, that some, somewhat of an armature. But, but this still, I, I like very much that the felt not only has kind of gives the surface upholstery, but it also provides structure for the seat. So it's very sculptural as well as um, having a great surface texture. Um, and actually, and remnants actually sort of come into my work quite a lot. This is actually uh, waste material that I, we, the, in fact, the product, you saw all those little industrial gaskets and things. The product in this material is actually the whole, and it's used to, to clean pipes and machinery. So this is actually a waste material, This, this um, these rolls of, of uh, cut, die-cut um, white, half inch thick, really lovely, 100% wool felt. So, um, you know, seeing stacks of this stuff, I ended up thinking, well, melt lampshades. And, and these were a couple of uh, experiments. And then I ended up producing this as a product that was distributed through Eurolite here. And um, so I, to, I, in some of my work, I couldn't really uh, discuss without some kind of acknowledgement to Joseph Boys and Robert Morris, for those of you who are art world connected. Um, the, it's, yeah, many of you would most likely would know, um, that, uh, Boyce is certainly known for his work with felt through his personal mythology that he developed and performed even, and Robert Morris for minimalist sculptures. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I'm gonna show a couple of projects that sort of do make, make reference to theirs. This, this piece actually of Robert Morris is called 256 Pieces of Felt, and it's this, this pile of felt, and it's all sort of about gravity and how to, you know, form takes shape in a minimalist kind of formalist way. And so with my, I call this 124 pieces of felt. It's sort of Robert Morris meets uh, Martha Stewart. <laughs> and this kind of DIY uh, primer for rustic modern living. And, uh, and so I've made all these products ex kind of exploiting the material properties of felt um, in a kind of fun, I, I like to think it's sort of a playful, hopefully sort of humorous way. And um, sort of replicating almost the Lee Valley kind of catalog that um, shows each piece. And each each item is actually made from one square, either a square or a rectangular piece of felt. So I'm, again, very interested in the sculptural aspects, the fact that just a, full, a pinch or a fold um, can make a, a, a three-dimensional functional item. Um, so this, and then I this did this for a come up to my room, the alternative uh, design show uh, that... Um, was put on during Design Week in Toronto. I took this to sort of the fashion um, world through this project called Shelter. And um, again, using the properties of felt, all these clothing items double as survival gear. So once again, playing up on these physical, uh, the, the felt resists flames, yet resists, uh, I think I say it here, resists, um, he has all this ready to wear. Um, uh, uh, line that's resist frame, re resist flames, resist chemicals, insulates against heat and cold. It's a padding. It's a shield. It's a shelter. And then, um, and so you can, I've displayed it down at Harbor Front in my project window. And then I've kind of used the pattern. Again, each item is a square or a rectangle, and I sort of use the sewing pattern format to show that the hat doubles as a filter, and the. Uh, um, Dress can be made from just the one piece. The skirt doubles as a, a floor mat. The cape can be a tent. 
and the pack and, and even footwear. So I made a whole um, it's a uniform outfit with the, the felt. So I'm just going to go through a few um, architectural projects. I started kind of working with um, architects in a consultation way. It was a big learning curve for me because I was approached by, in this case, it was um, Bruce Mao at the signage contract for the Walt Disney Concert Hall and this Frank Gehry's uh, building down there it's, uh, in Los Angeles. They did the donor wall that I felt. So I did prototype development for for them, and it was, it was produced in... Um, uh, um, in LA, but uh, you can see the um, uh, the cutting, the, the the great quality of felt is can be cut out, and so through CAD CAM, you know, possibilities you can cut out. This is um, I actually cut on a water jet machine these tiles, um, and uh, then we did this for the Native Child Family Services here in Toronto with Levitt Goodman Architects, and I worked with Bev Kosky and um, Seventh Generation Image Makers to do this. Um, and it's a relief, and that we take the other side and put it on the uh, the back side, and it's a moving wall. Um, again, cut out just simple squares. This um, was uh, done for Charles Street Video, an, an editing suite that needed some acoustic um, enhancement. So um, it's kind of pulled the the traditional kind of cone wave-like shapes of other acoustic materials, and and uh, revamp the or cut the felt to sort of mimic that, but. Um, you know, give kind of an interesting optical effect to it, so it, it absorbs sound, but also and it looks good. <laughs> um, and a uh, couple of others. So here's the detail you can see; it's just layered um, squares. This is a woven um, uh, head hanging wall hanging that's um, I did with uh, Yabu Pushelberg of a model suite in um, a hotel in Seattle. Here's a detail. Um, and this is a, Glad's, a suite at the Gladstone Hotel. Some of you may know the Gladstone, of course, the artist design rooms. And I did the wall, and you might recognize the lamps here. Um, then a further sort of modeling with the felt. Again, I, I um, have taken uh, that stitch pinch and just, again, the square to these friezes, more decorative. I did this for the a Cooper Hewitt exhibition about felt, and it was actually a site-responsive piece. I did this um, along the molding and sort of took some of the flora and fauna uh, motifs of the Georgian mansion that houses the museum and did this along um, some of the, uh, chair, the chair rails. And uh, it is, again, uses one, each of these units the, um, uses one square foot of felt, and it's, there's a strip and two squares, and it's... Uh, Again, sort of uses the maximum yield. I'm going to just show you a few, a sequence of a, a um, treatment, for lack of a better word, a kind of a way that I've used strips of felt to create walls, starting here with the, it was developed first with this B space, an architecture firm in New York, as a screening room doors. They wanted to get that um, layered look, um, like stacked felt to build the, on the door. And um, it was, uh, yeah, we you I tend to use up roll ends where I can and they're just stripped the strips are cut and then stacked. And it's sort of where felt begs to be used to kind of show off different thicknesses and tones. And you can see it done in different ways. So I try to um I like doing you know, building the these panels to fit site so you get the built in effect. This is the uh, Hotel Germain in Calgary. This is actually Mill Street down in the distillery district, the bistro down there. I think they call it a beer hall, actually. It's their new, rare, fairly new restaurant, a couple of years, I think a year and a half or so. Um, and then this is sort of maxed out with um, uh, this uh, theater at the Museum of Tolerance through with Yazdani Studio um, of Canon Design. They saw the sample of the, the striation series that I've done, and uh, they had this curved wall and said, can you do it for this situation? And so we um, did. I did panels and involved a couple of site visits, but um, it was probably, you know, one of the biggest projects I've done. So as you can imagine, I have a lot of strips around, and so kind of working with the remnants, I created these series of felt vessels. This is five-yard vessels, I call them, and they're sort of a play that each time they're made, they're in the collection, actually, in Cambridge, galleries and each time they're done they're they're just made differently and it just shows sort of the range of form that one strip can take and then I you know with glue we can make them into actually a functional item and I've used done these as a part of a product line 
So just coming back to the product line, as I said, I sort of started with the handbags. And as you can imagine, over 15 years, I've accumulated, despite actually, you know, emphasizing maximum yield, I do end up with a lot of remnants. So I get roll ends and a lot of ends of, um, of uh, cuttings. And so I do end up with a lot of remnants. And I did a series of quilts that I've just actually sort of pieced together and puzzled um, into um, a series of quilts. So I like very much, again, it's sort of using all of um, the uh, aspects of the production, using as much as I can of the <laughs> material. And then I'll just show you, this was a, um, uh, uh, an example of a, an installation that I, where I also use remnants, a little bit more experimental, where it's, again, sort of the art, an art project can come out of some of the, uh, sort of balance my practice with them, some of the design product commissions, and then it enables me to do these a bit more experimental um, projects that I did here for the Images Festival in a storefront space on Queen Street. And I rigged my sewing machine so it operated a film, film projector via a pulley system. So the rate of the sewing affects the rate of the image of this billowing smokestacks. And so recalling the labor behind industry, and over the course of the one week, um, the, the quilt, this quilt-like mass really um, accumulated in the window. And then over time, this is inside on the left and then on the outside on the right, and it uh, accumulated over time. And it was interesting because in the image of the smokestack, so it's also at the same time deteriorated over time. So I'm just going to end with this piece. Um, it's kind of a fun piece that I actually did um, at, uh, for the interior design show as a special projects. Um, it's a, a chair, convertible chair. It goes from a chair to a backpack to, I call this my Occupy piece. You can take it to the, take it to the street. And it's a personal tent. And, uh, so it's kind of fun. I'm actually just currently working on a, want to do a video that will animate it. But, um, I end with this because it sort of, um, I think also shows, it, well, yeah, you can zip it. So we, actually you can see it's got these zips. You can zip it together too and it creates a kind of, a communal space. Um, and you can see, yes, yeah, so I'm working on some images for it. And, uh, and then you can sort of see it sort of shows also the influences of my practice, the, again, the material culture, visual art, and, and design. Thank you. This is not yes, I Don't get it wet. <laughs> So, uh, switching over. Uh, so, in the meantime, I'm going to present Megan. Uh, so, uh, when I contacted uh, Sarah Quinton from Textile Museum, um, I told her that I was looking for artists who were working with textiles, but uh, they were working in a different way, and uh, she immediately uh, suggested that I contacted Megan. So Megan Price holds a degree in textile construction from the Montreal Center for Contemporary Textiles and an MFA from Concordia University. Uh, her work has been exhibited in Canada and the U.S., Turkey, Ukraine, Italy, Cuba, Sweden, Argentina, and Australia. Um, she has been the recipient of awards from Canada Council for the Arts, Le Conseil des Arts and des Lettres du Québec, uh, the Ontario Arts Council, and Toronto Arts Council. She has held references at Artspace, Sydney, Open Studio, Toronto, and the Scottish Sculpture Workshop. Um, she lives in Toronto and teaches at OCAD University. So, uh, do I? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, so I'm going to. All right. Um, I don't know if I've spoken to a crowd like this before, and I have to say that I'm feeling a little bit intimidated by the, the science here, um, because I've, I've recently started calling myself a deep dabbler when it comes to science. And um, so I, I revere the field and I look to it. Um, 
but I'm not a scientist and I'll never be one, but I kind of, um, maybe I'm like a, um, like a DJ who samples from science and mashes it up and makes a bad kind of, or it, different versions of it at times maybe. Um, but anyway, so this piece up here, for example, is, is called String Theory and it's a jacquard weaving, um, and uh, so Roberta spoke a little bit about jacquard weaving, and it is, um, um, I think, the textile world is proud to say that it's the predecessor to the computer, the jacquard loom. And so, um, you know, there was the analytical uh, machine, analytical engine that was developed prior to the jacquard loom and punch cards. And um, so basically weaving is the binary code on or off, up or down, and uh, punch cards. Uh, that language is the digital language, the zeros and ones, right? Um, so get back to the beginning. Um, this nice quote from Roman Signer, who's a, a, an art visual artist, um, the idea of thinking with material. Um, for me, this, this strikes a chord, so to speak. Um, the idea that material and process is a language of communication. Um, and that making like writing is a, a way of thinking. It's a, it's an, an act of thinking when you're, when I'm making anyhow. Um, and so I always feel when I'm describing my work, my visual art in words that I'm misrepresenting it because my first means of communication is with material and, and visually and materially um, constructing ideas rather than expressing them in words. But I'll go through um, my practice and um, the ideas that influence it. Um, so my background is in weaving. So this is a traditional floor loom. Um, and my primary material is a linear pliable element. So um, that's often referred to as yarn, but I prefer to use things like monofilament and wire typically. Um, so my education is in, um, I have a, a, a degree in textile construction, so specifically in creating textiles from the linear pliable element and um, building textiles rather than um, surface treating textiles. So there's, those are the kind of two major families in the world of textiles, construction and surface, and I'm from the world of construction. So I was trained in, in weaving, um, and the, the woven language and that kind of uh, code of, of um, developing textiles um, uh, in, and, and very um, at, at a school at the Montreal Center for Contemporary Textiles, which is a hardcore craft, you know. Um, it's, it's all about skill and learning how things are done correctly. Um, so I, I, came, I came out of that with a real real knowledge of how to properly weave um, and then of course you know work very creatively within those parameters there's another graduate from the um, program in the room um, so look forward to talking um, and then I went on and did a master's of fine arts at Concordia and um, and worlds collided and there was culture clash and uh, I was lost and found um, and so now my career is centered in textiles I work as a designer, as an artist, and as a teacher. Um, and so I'll talk about my design practice, and then I'll follow that with my, my artistic art practice. Um, so as a designer, I create um, jacquard woven textiles uh, for a business called String Theory. Um, so here is a, a smattering of the collection from String Theory. So as I'm sure everyone in the room knows, String Theory is a theory in physics that says the world is essentially composed of vibrating strings. That's my, that's my um, elevator speech for String Theory. Um, and, uh, and then we, whoops, I think we're on some timer here now suddenly. Oh. Um, Anyhow, so we borrowed the name, and we knit and weave scarves and shawls. Um, and so I have a partner, Lisanne Latulip, and she knits, and I uh, design the wovens. So here is a computer-assisted jacquard loom weaving five scarves across the width of the warp. Um, and on the right, you see woven structure. So it's the XY 
axis, uh, the vertical is the warp and uh, the horizontal is the weft. Oh, does anyone know how to turn this timer off really elegantly? Um, so woven structure is the binary system, as I was mentioning. Uh, a thread either goes over another or under another. So with a Jacquard loom, um, uh, the system is either raising threads in the warp or not raising threads in the warp. And um, and, uh, and 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 it's as simple as that. Um, this is a uh, automated knitting machine, computer-assisted knitting machine. Um, so there's a shawl being knit there. Uh, the structure of a knit is uh, the result of one single thread being continuously looped onto itself. Um, and so by nature, um, a knit is stretchy. Um, with knitting and weaving, with textile construction, uh, structure is surface. So a lot like um, uh, the felt work that we were looking at earlier, this idea that structure is surface in that chair. I love this idea. Um, the pattern is not added to the surface, but is embedded in the very making of the fabric. Um, so the fabric is, or the pattern, is helping to tell the story of the construction of that cloth. Um, and so with string theory, bouncing around here, um, uh, we are looking at pattern in the world and uh, specifically specifically pattern as evidence of occurrences. So um, the, that gum on the, the sidewalk there would be evidence of, uh, you know, there might be an office there. Uh, people are going out on the sidewalk to smoke and spitting out their gum. Or there's a story there that's built up uh, with pattern. Um, and like I said, the pattern of woven structure can actually recount the act of weaving. Um, so patterns observed elsewhere tell other stories, and we interpret those into uh, textiles for cloth. Um, so the story of frost is um, uh, that the size of crystals depends on the amount of time that they've been building up, um, the temperature, the amount of vapor available, and maybe how well insulated your windows are. Um, and so this was a photograph of frost on a studio window that got interpreted into this uh, shawl. Um, so the crystals became pixels through digital photography. And then uh, using a CAD program, those pixels are interpreted and communicated to the uh, we, uh, knitting machine um, as stitches. So you could think of the crystals are now stitches in that design. Um, and here is Montreal's Habitat 67. Lizanne and I are both Montrealers. And um, so this was, you know, um, on, in, in, in part of our culture as children growing up. This, this is Moishi Safdie's Habitat 67. Um, and it is another occurrence of structure being surface. There is no superfluous cladding on this building. Um, it is what you see, what is what you get. Um, it's a pattern of blocks that are stacked. Um, it was at the time a revolutionary approach uh, to this um, prefabricated modular um, uh, off-site uh, building and then assembly. And so I looked at that um, and I found this nice diagram on the right there of um, all of the potential residencies that are within that building and kind of exploded Habitat 67 and created a pattern out of it for this scarf. Um, so that's a bit about string theory, um, our string theory. Um, and I'll talk now about my art practice um, where textile techniques are used to make things that are more like drawings and prints and sculptures. So this is just the home page of my website. Um, and I'll talk about some of those projects. Um, I love how Suzanne Kuchler has articulated the potential of string here. So she talks about string having the potential to carry the nature of variation, to act as a thinking environment, uh, and to carry a sense of an emerging and perpetually transforming material world in which things and thoughts coalesce. Um, this is a pivotal work for me after um, 
the kind of top-down education that I got in craft, um, I uh, um, decided to kind of um, push it further and push myself further and, and try working with improvisation on the loom, which is um, is a difficult thing to do because designing a woven is involves first you know there's a there's a big design process that happens before you start weaving and your kind of um, the parameters within which you play on the loom are quite um, delineated before you sit down there so um, I, I think for a long time I'd been searching for ways to be free in that process um, and, and this came out. So it's a kind of flow chart. You could think of it as a flow chart, um, that it is um, evidence of paths forged through a series of decisions. Um, so I have decided whether the weft is intersecting the warp or not in these kind of block areas. And then, um, and then these, these paths are forged. And um, so this was not kind of premeditated. It was um, um, improvised. Um, and then this kind of improvisation allowed me to recognize associations between textile construction um, and structure and pattern in my surroundings. So this um, flipping my system from top down to bottom up allowed me to start seeing um, patterns in the world around me that were um, uh, bottom up as well. So Barcelona would be a nice example of both both systems there. So you have the new part of the city that is on the grid, and you have you know, the Gothic quarter, the old part of the city that was more organically um, uh, shaped through need and individuals' decisions rather than uh, you know, urban planners deciding how things were going to be laid out. Desire lines are another, I think, beautiful example of this. Um, this is a term, I think, uh, Sorry, coined by Gaston Bachelard in The Poetics of Space. Um, and it's the idea that individual actions or decisions can accumulate to form a greater structure. Um, and from what I understand, sometimes architects and um, landscapers will um, uh, actually use this uh, technique as a technique for deciding where paths should be laid around a new structure. So letting the kind of users decide where the paths should be before paving them. I like that idea a lot. Um, and then another example of a self-organizing or emergent pattern or system um, would be the way birds flock. Um, um, so here we have this um, order emerging from chaos and flux and accumulated chance um, or decisions leading to habit or pattern. And the way these are European starlings flocking, and the way that works is that one bird has its eye on seven birds around it. The same way we navigate crowds, you know, you don't have no idea how the crowd is moving if it's big enough. You just, you know, you're working in relation to the people that are immediately around you. Um, and then and then somehow um, this this Forms, there's some kind of agreement there that happens and, and, uh, and um, pattern and movement happens, uh, fluctuating pat pattern and movement. So I started making work uh, that started on the loom and then um, using kind of excess warp and weft ends, I was acting like starlings is what I called the project. So I was trying to not design at all and just kind of improvise and follow my nose. And if you think of each of these little loops, that right there is one decision that um, you know it starts to um, where the beginning of a path might be. Um, so um, these are uh, copper, enameled copper wire pieces. They're all about this big. They're, they're very small, um, and sometimes I, I pin them up uh, in relation to each other. I think of them as parts of a whole. It's, it's somehow a kind of constantly changing modular system. Um, this is another example. And I'm really interested in how um, maybe through mimicking behavior that you can possibly end up creating the, the thing that 
that invented that behavior or, or kind of recalling it in some way unknowingly. Um, so uh, there, there are lots of kind of references to nature that emerge out of these or animals and wind and waves and all of that stuff, but it really wasn't intended at all. Um, and then um, I was thinking about the textile medium and how it has been regarded um, in relation to other mediums. Um, and I was interested in the authority that um, information on paper has and how um, interesting exploring how these structures um, could be, by committing them to paper through printing, um, could somehow be aligned with diagrams and writing and other forms of um, communicating knowledge, real knowledge. Um, so I'm really... I just I like the question of what is the difference between lace and lace on paper, and I found two examples that are really fascinating. Um, these being um, William Henry Fox Talbot was the inventor of early photo processes in the mid 19th century, um, and, and this is a photogram of lace, um, which emphasizes the textile structure. Um, and in his quote, there you see it. This, this dainty frivolity aligned with scientific knowledge. So somehow by turning this into, taking the lace and turning it into a photo, it's somehow closer to science now that it, um, you know, um, it's, yeah, it's no longer the dainty frivolity that it is, and it's, it's really about, it's, it's more closer to scientific knowledge and math at this point. Um, and then in this next example, um, we have a patent for lace. Um, so here, aligning lace making with engineering and intellectual property. Um, and I always think of textile structures as engineering in miniature. Anyhow, you know, the, all the, the laws of physics are all at play there. You know, the, the, the yarn you choose uh, already is going to dictate how the, you know, the, the structure it can take and how that structure will behave and so on. Um, but um, somebody has thought to patent this, this really ancient um, technique, which I think is really interesting. So these are some examples of um, monoprints. So what I've done here is, I know it's tough to tell the difference between what is the wire and what is the print, and I like that a lot too. Um, sometimes I show them side by side. Um, and so to achieve this, I've simply rolled ink on the wire structure and put it through a press. So if you were to see this in person, if you were to look to the back of the paper, you would see the impression of the, the wire structure there as well. So it's kind of like a fossil. And um, I really enjoy that the embossing somehow um, that... It, it, it's proving itself against the world or something there with the, with the paper. Um, um, and this is a little book that I made that I called Index, and um, it's uh, accordion fold, and it's probably about eight feet wide when you stretch it out, and um, a lot of different um, wire drawing structures there are printed in relation to each other. So there's a kind of a story somehow. Um, and then with the Acting Like Starlings project, I also used some digital fabrication. So I went back to um, jacquard weaving as well. Um, these are kind of wonky images of two jacquard looms. The one on the left is at a uh, hexagram uh, at Concordia, where I did my MFA, and I worked as a research assistant uh, for Barbara Lane um, at hexagram. So I had access to this loom, which was wonderful. And then on the right is the loom that we weave the scarves on, and that's at a mill in North Carolina. Essentially, the difference between the two is that the, the industrial loom is fully automated, whereas the one at Concordia, you're still throwing the shuttle, which, which is, offers opportunities for more hand manipulation and kind of, you know, slower work and, um, you know, doing things with the warp that an industrial loom does not want you to do. Um, so I took those images of uh, flocking starlings and um, translated them, you know, through the logic of uh, jacquard weaving. So in the same way that the, the crystals became stitches, the kind of birds became uh, pixels and then woven structure. 
um, and then uh, I used excess warp um, to kind of go in afterwards and um, uh, you know I- improvise and 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 create another kind of system of knots. And I like the idea of of coming off the it's not canvas, but coming off the, the woven cloth. And all, I always like the idea of the potential for these structures to continue out in the world, that they, they relate um, infinitely outwards. It's another um, weaving from the same series. Um, and then another uh, um, iteration uh, using digital fabrication, this is a water jet uh, cutter. It's a robot that spits water and sand, and it's cutting five mil um, steel. And I, so it, what it's cutting out is this. Um, so now the little wire piece that go, has gone from this to to this, um, and it's 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 kind of um, uh, there's a, there's a second piece in front of it. Um, so this was uh, part of the Lovelace exhibition. It was an international exhibition of contemporary lace work in Sydney at the Powerhouse Museum. Um, and so this is a side view of it from a different day, a different different setting. Um, uh, so there are kind of two panels that are um, connected together, and it essentially can flat pack, which is nice. So you can kind of knock those hinges out, and the whole thing um, is flat. And um, and so you can see the woven structure there, um, the warp and the weft there, and all of uh, like all of these lines are lines that I've manipulated with my hands in small scale with wire, but now it's giant and it's steel. And um, I didn't really know why I was doing it, but you know, like how many times had I heard make it bigger? You should make this really big, and so I did. And um, you know, it was satisfying in ways and in other ways not at all because my hands weren't on it and it was almost too easy and that robot worked all night and I just went to bed. <laughs> so, yeah. And this is called Habitat Wave, um, getting back to Moishe Safdie's habitat. There's actually a, a continuous wave um, in um, the river uh, that Habitat is on and surfers use it. So um, it kind of, the, the form looks a bit like a wave, so... Um, I borrowed Habitat again. Um, this is a more recent project um, where I borrowed um, graphs from this book called Design Data for Aeronautics and Astronautics that was produced in 1962. So from patterns of birds in flight, I've gone to patterns uh, about data, about humans wanting to be in flight. Um, and so I made wire drawings in relation to these uh, graphs um, and kind of extending the idea of poet- poetically translating d- data through textile structures. Um, sorry. Um, and using what uh, Kuchler identified as string's potential to carry a sense of an emerging and perpetually transforming material world in which things and thoughts coalesce. I just love that. Um, and, and also... Um, full disclosure, to kind of make in a state of wonder or unknowing. As I said earlier, I am a deep dabbler. I'm not, um, you know, a physicist. And, um, you know, these ideas kind of capture the imagination, and I want to stick with them and um, kind of spend some time with them. And it's through making, um, in this case, in relation um, to this information that, um, that I do that. So here's a little process image. Um, so to control the wire as I'm working, there are pins being stuck in a foam board that sits under the image. And as you can see, there are pin pricks building up on that image. So the end work, um, which is very tough to see there on the right-hand side because it's deep, deep, dark, dark blue. Um, so what you see on the left is a wire drawing, the wire drawing that was made on top of the um of the, of, oh, that's nice. Um, and then on the right is a silk screen. So there are um, two, two passes, two, two layers to this print. Um, there's the blue where the holes 
Um, what you're seeing is the paper. Um, the paper that's under the blue is you're seeing um, what I think of as a kind of constellation in the end. And then the graph itself is there in a, in a more of a gel. It's not a color. It's, it's more just kind of catching light. So really tough to photograph. Um, and then this is a second version. And I used um, the titles of the diagrams as the titles for the work. So this is Geopotential, and the previous one was neg Neglecting Drag. Um, and then finally, I'll just talk about new work um, that I'm, I'm developing right now um, in relation to geology. Um, so I'm working with patterns that are found in geology, um, both in the natural world and as represented in geological mapping. So um, what you see on the left there is uh, a stratigraphy, um, which is uh, the study of rock layering and um, how rock layering basically communicates the history of the world. Um, and uh, so the uh, U.S. Geological Survey has kind of standard patterns that they use to stand in for different types of rock, like limestone, <coughs> and, um, uh, metamorphic rock, and igneous, and there's some conglomerate in there. The, the brick pattern is actually stands in for uh, limestone. And so I'm kind of remaking um, a map uh, much like this, a diagram much like this, um, as my way of kind of bridging my time with deep time, um, kind of, you know, materializing this thing. Um, so I'm making a stack of 38 quilts um, and kind of recreating one of these columns and um, in doing so kind of aligning um, stratigraphy with uh, the linen closet. And um, in the linen closet, I see that our own kind of personal history is there. Um, if I think about, you know, my Auntie Cheryl's linen closet, there is, you know, um, somebody crocheted this and somebody else qu qu quilted that and, you know, these towels my mother gave to me and so on. So there's, I'm, you know, attempting to bridge deep time and, and my time um, with this project. And finally, um, this project will be um, part of this exhibition that's opening on Friday at the Craft Ontario Gallery. Um, it's called Sensori Sensorial Objects, and it's the work by uh, faculty from OCAD U uh, Fiber Studios. So there's a list of participating artists there. Um, Lynn Heller is here. And, um, and then in June, I have a solo exhibition coming up at Katzman Contemporary. So um, thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.